I met a gang member not long after I had them, and the gangs were different back then, they were old school. Come in, sat down, he wasn't invited of course, sat down, put a gun on the table, jumped him and got shot. I had no doubt that he was going to try and kill me. Yeah, I've been in standover places, I've been in places no woman has any business been in. I know I've had angels, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. Young soldier of God. Steady march. I'm Lee, and I'm from Donnelly's Crossing originally, uh, which is up north, and spent time in Tauranga, Auckland, Rotorua, uh, very short in Rotorua, but um, yeah, done a bit of travelling and ended up back up north. Dave and I are both here at Arapahui Bush Retreat, where we look after those with addictions and that need healing for trauma. Um, it is a faith-based mission, and Dave and I are volunteers here, and we love it. I ended up here at Arapahui um, as a guest for treatment for addiction to meth, which has been most of my adult life, um, off and on. So that's how I got here. Meth has probably left me with pretty uh, shattered relationships, no real, real friends. And although I was quite high functioning, as in I could still work, I um, pretty much lost everything. Um, Self-esteem being a biggie. Um, pretty much made me a slave to the meth lifestyle and and the drugs. So I felt kind of destitute and just really lonely at the end of that. Mm. Where are you at now? Where I'm at now, I'm way better in a way better spot, but there's always more to do. Um, I am. Oh, well, I found God here at Arapahui. Um, my dad is probably been praying for me since I was born. Well, definitely has been. So he's spent a lot of time in prayer for me, so hopefully some of that's coming true. But um, it sort of hasn't been easy to um, grasp the Christian lifestyle after living pretty rough for years. So it is um, a work in progress, and every day is new, different, challenging. Um yeah, we're growing, we're expanding. Um, I was adopted probably when I was about a month old by a my dad and my mum who had two sons already and I was the daughter that dad had always wanted. Um, I believe that I was hand, they were handpicked for me actually uh, because dad has just been a solid Christian um, my whole life and my mum was as well, so... Ultimately, as far as growing up in an adopted family, I was lucky, really lucky, because I know to this day that they loved me and they loved each other and they loved my brothers and we were a proper family. Um, in saying that, I want to speak into adoption a little bit because back then it was so secretive and it was the answer to three people's problems, like people who couldn't have kids suddenly had a kid. Mothers who perhaps weren't married could give them a baby. That is an ongoing battle and that need for acceptance is so big. And I think that when you're growing in your mother's tummy, that time kind of gets pushed down as if it's not important, but it really actually is important. Because when you're born, those people who are supposed to love you should be there and they should be doing their job and unfortunately when they're not there's a real deficit in the way you grow up whether you're given tremendous amounts of love or no love there's always a void and that's um we're really well represented in alcohol and drug rehab centers like it's a well-known fact that adoptees have a pretty tough time my birth family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I searched for them um, probably three three or four times. Then finally I did a last stint because uh, my dad was always sort of trying to push me to find them. I did my last stint when I did DNA last year and mm, I found them. Um, 
but my mother um, has dementia and she didn't have a clue who I was um, and my dad had already passed. But yeah, it's a shame that I couldn't build a relationship with my mother. Um, yeah, it's a real shame. Um, I knew as soon as I kind of, I knew anyway, um, intrinsically, because I always knew I was different. I could feel that. Um, but from the age of knowledge of adoption, yes, I've never been lied to about it. And um, and I'm truly grateful for that. We went to church every Sunday and God was a big part of our family and friends. But um, I think maybe the catalyst for my teenage years happened quite soon after that when my mum got sick and um, I was 10 when she went to hospital. She had an epileptic fit and she came right the next day, but what I remember is something happened and she was launched into a coma. She wasn't on life support. She just wasn't with us. Um, but she stayed in that coma for 18 months. And as a family, we used to go across to the hospital from Madam Adam maybe three or four times a week. And it was really hard um, for my dad. It was pretty heartbreaking watching him break. But um, as a 10-year-old girl, uh, I was kind of chucked into the, oh, you're the female. How about you do some of the work around here? Um, and I had no clue what I was doing. Like, we ate some pretty crappy meals, I tell you. And I was still like, um, working on the farm, but I started to really resent my life. I felt like um, I was being, I don't know, I was being forced into into being a lot older than what I really was. Um, I didn't realise it at the time, that that's when I sort of started going, mm -hmm, something's wrong here. Um, but then when I was 12, my mum actually passed away and it broke my dad's heart. Oh, it broke all of our hearts, really. Um, but dad tended to, or dad kind of left too because he was so, he had so much faith in the Lord that she would come out of it. He never doubted that. And then she was gone and he kind of left us as well, um, not physically but spiritually. And physically he kind of left. He was always on the farm. And I sort of started throwing tantrums about this and was like, okay, any attention's good attention. And I think and that was the start of my kind of raucous, teenage, rebellious, awful child years. I was really angry at God for taking my mum. Not for me, but for my dad, because I watched him break. And um, I needed someone to blame, so I blamed God. And I was angry for years and years. And um, I blamed him for taking dad as well. Um, and I was like, what sort of a God is going to let someone who's loved them and had had belief their whole lives die like that but you know he has reasons and I believe that there was a reason for all that it may not be clear yet but hopefully it'll get clear one day I was awful I was just flat out rebellion I was just wagging used to hitchhike you know to Hamilton with a girlfriend and get back before the school bus and I just didn't do school at all um, I started smoking drinking and I was actually quite good at drinking back then. I could sort of keep up with the boys and um, started, you know, just being a bit crazy, really. And my dad tried his best, but he he gave up, really. He was just like, you're too hard. I can't deal with you. And I spent a lot of time at a girlfriend's place where her mum kind of became my mum as well. Um, I left school and went to Auckland to start hairdressing and... Hello. Um, I was 16 and I stayed at probably perfect strangers' houses. I mean, I didn't I didn't really know them. I'd met this lady's son at camp once and I went to live with them, but um, Auckland was just like, well, you know, and I was sort of fresh out of the cow poo into the city and that was a real adjustment period, but I started to really enjoy the nightlife, the partying, and even though, I mean, my girlfriend and I used to make, I think it was like $82 or something a week, and we'd go out four nights a week and still 
you know, have a great time. But what, what I thought was a great time was sort of slowly degenerating into really dangerous times. So. Well, can you go into that, how it started getting dangerous and stuff? And this is still at 16. That's what, sorry? At, at, at 16. Oh, 16 wasn't so bad. Um, actually, I was pretty good, but I did drink heavily, but binge drink and put myself in really dumb situations. And back then... There was pot, but there were no real hard drugs on the streets like today. Um, I used to um, do a bit of acid, but I loved acid. I thought acid was just great. I'd laugh and carry on. But um, then I, well, actually, yeah, I got pregnant and ended up shifting from Auckland to Tauranga because that's where my dad was. And I had a set of twins. Oh. Um, I was 22 when I had them. I met a gang member not long after I had them and um, found this wonderful thing called speed that you could snort and just do have a great time and party and, and even go home and you'd still feel great. You wouldn't get hangovers and I fell in love with it and I used it just on the weekends to start with and everyone did back then I think though it was a real it was a real sociable drug you know um and the gangs were different back then they were old school and there were bands playing and real just real party times um but that sort of gateway to the drug is what led me led me down um much darker paths than that and I guess in some ways I learned a healthy respect for for those guys because you know they're like we're into drugs but we don't shoot up we don't do this we don't do that and they were rules that always stuck with me um so in some ways I'm kind of thankful they were all family men but they all had bits on the side and all the rest of it, but that wasn't what I was interested in at all. It was more so the party. And, um, yeah. Um, when, what would you, when would you say things started getting darker? Not until after I had my kids, which is really sad because that's when I delved into drugs, which is kind of crazy because I already had um, my girls and... Um, what happened was I split up with that gang member, he went to jail, and I met someone else who was very violent, um, very mentally, mentally not right, um, and I got into this violent relationship, um, jumped in boots and all, and he came to live with us, uh, with the girls and I and and basically made life really difficult for my kids and me. But we split up and he came round to the, my girlfriend's place where I was living and come in, sat down. He wasn't invited, of course, sat down, put a gun on the table and said, oh, I need to talk to you. And I just went, Okay, and I said to my girlfriend, can you take my kids and put them up in the end room and stay with them so that they don't see this? And he really started um, being really evil. Anyway, my best friend's man at the time jumped him and got shot and he bit the end of his my ex's nose off, but my ex was on the run for 18 months before he got caught. And in that time, it was total harassment. The police came. We I ended up in women's refuge for a couple of nights. And um, thankfully, my dad took my kids. Um, but in that time, I started, well, meth made a debut. And in that time, um, I felt like I'd lost it all. I was being stalked. Um, I was just trying to be safe. My girls were at my dad's, but dad realised that my drug problem was getting bigger than my my love for my kids and my old life. Um, and I was said to him, you need to keep them um, because I'm not in control anymore. And I was learning to cook then. 
Um, and it got just really crazy and I got resentful at my dad because he didn't want to give them back when I said I was ready. I wasn't. Um, and my girls built resentment for me in that time because they wanted their mum and I put um, the substance. It got really bad in that time when I didn't have them because of my ex. It was too dangerous to have them. I had no doubt that he was going to try and kill me. Um, and I couldn't have them there. And it was just the most frustrating, heartbreaking time. And I just used drugs to not feel, to get Teflon. Yeah, and I got harder and harder and harder on my family. Um, oh, it was really awful. And, like, my girls and I have a lovely relationship now, but, you know, there was a lot of resentment there that I put a substance before them, and I understand that. And if you had, you know, if you could change it, you would, but I can't, and it's about moving forward and not being stuck in that shame and guilt about the things that I did that weren't right. Because um, thankfully we've got a God that doesn't hold grudges and um, I've got kids that don't hold grudges as well and we've been able to work through it all. I've got two grandkids and I tell you they're my life and I just love them um, wholeheartedly. But I had to learn how to love and be loved um, and that was a really tough thing to learn. Um, because I didn't think I was worthy and all those self-esteem things from way back manifest so, so badly and I don't know many women that walk this earth that don't have these self-esteem issues and um, that's where we need God to help heal and bring us through because, you know, we're all beautiful no matter what your size, your shape, we're all beautiful people and we're made in God's image. I was kind of always known as Libro, like I wasn't the girl's girl. Um, and girls were doing some really dumb stuff to get puffs, and I was just like, mm, not for me, thanks. So I fell in with somebody who was really close to me who set me up um, to help cook, and from there... Um, Nobody really knows much about this, but we did some pretty um, big cooks together. And, you know, I'd come out with next to nothing. And as in I'd come out with gear, but it didn't mean anything. And the money that I got, gone, because you have no respect for it because it's easy come, easy go. And, you know, I loved that living on the edge thing. I felt so alive and, like, you feel like you – it's, a, it's an addictive lifestyle, you know. It's different um, than your average kind of lifestyle. And you feel like you're some sort of, I don't know, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but you feel like you're living on this real fine line of what could make or break you, and you are. I'm just lucky I didn't fall into the completely break you side of things. Yeah, I've been in standover places. I've been in places no woman has any business been in but luckily I've had guardian angels and I thank my um and my dad and my dad for that <laughs> my earthly dad for all his prayers and my dad in heaven for putting his angels around me because I tell you um I know I've had angels otherwise I wouldn't be here today because I've been in so many situations where I shouldn't have walked away. The worse the people the better I got along with them it was just and I was starting to feel like I was one of these people um, but in the end before I came here I was using um, just quietly I'd go get my gear off one person and um, I'd smoke a bit I'd go to work I'd go home I may or may not have a puff or whatever, but at the end of the day, I was stuck in this routine and this pattern. Even though I was functioning on the on the outside, um, all my friends were kind of straight. I didn't hang out with crackheads, but I, I was just living this big lie. And when you're living a lie, you just get really sick of it and you get bored and you get lonely, you know? It's lonely having these dirty little secrets, so... Yeah, um, and I saw your interview with Janet online and when I saw it I was like, 
well, this, who is this chick? She's just telling my story. And I reached out, and that's how I ended up here. But funnily enough, as a family, we came and stayed at this bush camp. Um, must have been just before we shifted down to Matamata, and I gave my heart to the Lord then. When, and it's just really funny that I end up back here. Um, it feels like a spiritual kind of homecoming. And, you know, over the years I've delved into tarot cards, I've delved into the spiritual and the supernatural in that way. Um, but they, uh, they don't compare. Nothing really compares to that love of God and that feeling of God. And, and there's a supernatural realm that God is in and it's very real. Um, but I tell you what, it feels so much better um, to have God in your picture rather than grasping for things to believe in, you know, because it's empty. It is all empty. Since I got here, I, you know, recovery still, it's been straight, it's still a roller coaster. Life is still a roller coaster, but. Um, I've received a lot of healing for that rejection. I've broken a lot of family curses that I passed on to my children, but that come from my birth family, um, as well as you know, as a lot of a lot of curses that I've had on myself, and I've broken all them off. And still, it's still tough. Don't get me wrong. And sometimes I feel like giving up, but. My life is considerably much better since being here and being with this family, um, the family of people that we have here and God's family. And every day we'll do something that freaks Like it amazes me there'll be something, because I do suffer from unbelief, but then something will happen and I'll go, oh, that's God. That can only be God. And I'm like, you know, kick yourself. He's true, he's real, he's out there and, and you know, I, I 100% believe we need him more than ever in the end days because it is end times and I'm not trying to freak anyone out but <laughs> we're not going to go there. <laughs> but God is real and he made a promise to look after us, look after his people and he will and you have to have faith in that, you know. What was your relationship with God at, that, at those times? Oh, I was doing the big F you because um, because of, I used my mum's death as an excuse and and I used to look at Christians and the way they lived and think, oh, wow, they've never had a day of fun in their life, you know, thinking that what I was onto was so much more fun than what they had. But I also know that it was God that kept my dad rock steady and made him the person he is because he put up with a lot of stuff from me, but he stood fast. And and that's a love that I want to be capable of. And I know that it's only God that does that. Because if my kids had the same dad that I did, I know that they would feel less ripped off as well. So fathers are so important. And the love of a father's heart, you know, and you can get that from God. Because as humans, we all fall short. We all do dumb stuff. But, you know, it's about what we do about it that counts, I guess. You know, I think God's given me a gift, and he's given me this little gift of being quite discerning. And and I like to say sorry to the people that I have hurt, and it feels good to be able to admit my wrongs and take responsibility. And, you know... I'm forgiven whether you forgive me or not, I am forgiven. And and that's a real blessing. Um I have a friend who who I did some pretty horrible stuff to. I I ripped him off. And you know what? That guy is still in my life today and he's still one of my best friends and I admire even his tenacity to even still be in my life. And um yeah, I pray. I just pray for him and I pray for all those people out there that are miserable and caught in this trap. And, like, I know I used to think, oh, being a Christian, it's so weird and, like, they do weird stuff. But, you know, you don't often see a really sad Christian. They've got something that we haven't and it's not a substance. It's a, it's a 
Holy Spirit. It's something in them that gives them joy. And if you don't want a bit of that, there's something wrong. Reach out. Just reach out and get help any way you can and do it to keep you and your kids or and your family safe because they don't get better. You know, they don't get better. And, you know, we're not someone's collateral damage. We're women and we're powerful and we are, we we have children and we don't deserve to be treated like pieces of dirt. And I just really wish and hope that women can get empowered through God, through legacy, through um, all those courses and that that you might think are a bit dumb. They're so empowering and and they're freeing. And, you know, if you've got the guts to walk out that door and take your kids with you, it doesn't matter about your stuff, what you think you've lost, that will all be repaid tenfold. Yeah, only God can heal that because um, even when you find your birth family, it may not be what everything you hope or wish it could be because um, it was like that for me. I thought it was all going to be, oh, she's going to see me and she's going to remember me and she's just going to love me because she's my mum or you know, I'm going to have this whole new family who I can love and trust. And I was so excited about that. Um, but after I left there from meeting them the first time, I actually ended up in hospital because um, my what I thought, I thought I was having a heart attack, but um, for some reason I couldn't breathe and I ended up in hospital. Like, And I think that that was just... I had a picture and it didn't work out like that and it really actually played with me and I tried, I used to go around the quite a lot, I tried and tried but I can't superimpose myself into people's lives if they don't want me there. So I've just had to like handle that over and like get over that rejection <laughs> a little bit and just give it to God and go, well, you know what, I, I know where I've come from, I know what I'm made up of blood-wise but it's not as important as I thought it was going to be. Um, um, but I've had to, I I have suffered rejection, abandonment, all that. I used to hang on to partners so tight, so no wonder they wanted to run a mile. But that was because I just didn't know how to do anything healthily. Um, and that takes work and time and effort and talking. The reason I wanted to do this today was because testimonies reach me and they reach my heart and that's why I wanted to do this with you Dave because I love and trust you but um, because if this testimony can help even just half a person or one person or one girl or even a boy I just wanted it to get out there because testimonies are real and and they help and I, I love other people's testimonies. I love Dave's work. And I just feel like, yeah, it's just some surrendering. It's just surrendering to God and you can have a better life. It's actually, you know, a lot easier than what I thought. <laughs>